Hello and welcome to the Ahaki podcast. We invite different giants in the health sector to look at how we can grow as a continent and improve our health systems. Today on this podcast, I'm privileged to be hosting Professor Francis Omaswa, who is the founding executive director of the Africa Center for Global Health and Social Transformation. Professor Omaswa wears so many hats, is a cardiovascular surgeon, He's also an academician and also an administrator. Until then, he was installed as the chancellor for Soroti University. Professor here is a big giant in Uganda and indeed in Africa's health sector. Professor, it's so good to have you today. Thank you for making time. Thank you, Solomon. I'm really seated amidst greatness, I should add. Um, you a man I really admire. You have really served this country, Professor, with your heart in different capacities, including being the Director General at the Ministry of Health, you have traversed this country and indeed Africa to really advocate for health. You have stood up during medical strikes and said government needs to order, honor its commitment to pay health workforce. You were in the thick of it during the COVID-19 pandemic. I have seen you take the gospel of prevention across the entire continent. Today, I wanted us to really focus on our health systems as a continent. And Professor, what really happened to us during the COVID-19 pandemic was really telling. What we saw is Africa's health systems were stripped naked. Let's just walk back in history a little bit. And how did the COVID-19 pandemic find us as Africa as a continent in terms of our health systems, Professor? Well, Africa in comparison to the rest of the world is in a different league by ourselves. If you look at the health indices of other six regions of the WHO, the indices and their trends for the African continent have a big gap in terms of numbers compared to others. If you take maternal mortality, for example, the other developed countries, it's in single digits, seven, 100,000. In Africa, it is still in hundreds, 100,000. And the same applies to uh, infant mortality and so on. Mm -hmm. We have made a lot of improvements since the MDGs, and we are continuing to improve, but the gap between us and the others is such a big shame mm -hmm. and a pain for us. So oh, 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 COVID uh, exposed us, uh, COVID called for a response in which the entire population was switched on. The entire population was required to be alert, but also required to be reached mm -hmm. by the health system. I think alertness is easier using the media and so on. But then reaching people where they live, where the care is needed, is what is grossly lacking mm -hmm. in most African countries. Mm -hmm. We have been given guidelines, global guidelines, which make sense. In September this year, uh, I was one of the invited speakers at the uh, UN General Assembly which was on universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to speak about primary health care. Why does it matter? How can it be accelerated? That is the way forward for Africa. Integrated, people-centered primary health care in which the people participate themselves as a duty and as a right. And this is well articulated in the Alma Ata Declaration. Mm -hmm of uh, 1978, which calls for people to be engaged in determining their health. And these are many foundations. I think the first foundation is that scientific foundations these are now. We are by and large born healthy. Just a few people, 6% are born with something wrong with them. But the rest of us, we are born healthy. Mm -hmm. Our bodies, are organized in such a way that if something is going wrong, they will tell you the owner of the body. You are short of water. 
you feel thirsty you need a meal you feel hungry it is time to sleep you yawn and so on and so on so if people are made aware that this is the situation and that their health is their responsibility and then we organize them through community health systems to be able to meet in a village and talk about their health i have been doing this for some time particularly with covid recently mm-hmm. the president appointed me as the chair of the community engagement uh, subcommittee of the national task force and we called for establishment of village covid task forces in every lc1 and this was supported by the national task force and that was done and the lc1s were the chairs of this and they also brought in cultural leaders religious leaders opinion leaders and it did contribute to getting the message out there we also have in uganda what is called uh village health teams which are community health workers in in who live in the community and are members of the community mm-hmm. we trained them we equipped them including giving them uh smartphones to be able to pick data and re- re- uh, and inform the districts about this a suspicious case here come here please and also providing home based care so uh, my vision for the future for africa is to establish strong primary health care systems which are managed by the people with the people participating as a duty and a right and where this has been done here in Uganda uh, we I will give you this report but we had the pilot in four districts in Uganda uh-huh. Amuru Busia Mukono and Ngore and we established this village task forces we equipped and trained the vhts we attended regular monthly meetings of the committees and everything improved for example the women going to attend antenatals and to deliver in health facilities increased immunization coverage went up some diseases disappeared completely like diarrheal diseases and so on and this has been demonstrated to work again and again and again in wow. many countries but for some reason we are not scaling it up so in uh, new york in september at the un general assembly there were these lamentations we know what to do but we are not doing them those things which we know what to do mm-hmm. where is the problem where is the problem so from those who have uh, been successful some countries like thailand mm-hmm. for example uh, cuba uh, also sri lanka had done well at one time they and they achieved what is called good health at low cost good health at low cost and the components of that are integrated people centered primary health care as i have just described with mm-hmm. the people participating themselves and uh, this needs to be implemented over a long period of time 35% of the entire health budget would go to primary health care in those countries and uh, and then uh, on, on top of that uh, health what is called health literacy i was just uh, describing to you how people should know how their bodies work with them mm-hmm. that message is very important to reach the people where they live how uh, can you avoid diseases in your in your home you may recall in my days as director general here in uganda the statement recorded in my own voice sort of like health is made at home and only repaired in health facilities when it breaks down it everything starts home it, everything starts home everything starts and ends at home you know be clean in your home eat the right food don't share accommodation with animals and sleep and the mosquito net sleep and the mosquito net have your children immunized so those are responsibilities of households not of the government 
The government is needed to come in. You know, if it's about clean water, people may need to be assisted to access clean water. If it's immunization to make sure the vaccines are available easily for the population to mm -hmm. reach. But we need to develop a partnership between individuals and the health system so that they are synergistics. Professor, let me just come in right there. Mm. You, you, uh, you're coming from a place of prevention and community management. And mm. you, you were part of the team that started the, uh, the health systems at, at the community level. Do those still exist since COVID you know, is no longer a point of concern? Are they still here? Because you know, every after pandemics or every after we've gone through something, we forget very fast and everything just goes back to reset. That is true. I believe that is what has happened. Um, those village COVID task forces don't meet anymore. I think even the district COVID task forces don't meet anymore. Yet, we need to have in each and every district a permanent standing committee on health, which is chaired ideally, either should be by the chair of the district or the cow, a senior person, a top administrator, and then the district health system would act as its secretariat. And the real health workers are the administrators. You know, growing up in Uganda in colonial days, they had these chiefs, uh, you know, um, Tongo Rele, mm. Parish, and so on. Those people were health workers. They made sure people have pit latrines, their homesteads are clean, they sent their children to immunization. So health should become integrated into the routine governance of the people so that all the administrators are health workers, making sure that health laws are obeyed, the correct uh, foodstuffs are grown, and children are going to school, the water sources are there, the roads, if a woman is going to be taken to deliver, the vehicle can reach their home. Rural road. So it is all the same. It is integrated. You know, I, as you're speaking, Professor, yeah. I, I am reminded of um, Dr. Moses Mulumba's PhD thesis. And yeah. it, it was focusing on community participation in health, yeah. improving healthcare. Correct. And he argued that in his, in his defense, and I had the honor of um, attending it, yeah. he argued that for it to be sustainable, the community needs to own it. That is the word. Ownership ownership and ownership comes from first accepting that my health is my responsibility as a, a, a community in everybody as an individual then families and then the community we have a role to play but what has happened over time is that someone a child falls sick for example and a mother takes the child to a health facility Either there are no health workers or there are no drugs. They just go away and start looking for another solution. But what they should actually do is, why is this the case? Why are there no health workers here? Why are there no, no drugs here? They should hold the administrators accountable. So it is called demand, community demand. Community demand is very important because it keeps everyone on their toes, especially the, the, the duty bearers. So that's why uh, uh, empowered communities have a lot of potential to improve their health. A lot. Even solutions, they have the solutions. They meet and they talk and they find the solutions. And usually the solutions are not only about health, the issues they discuss. They discuss, you know, things like gender-based violence in that home is a problem. Why is it there? They talk about thefts. There are young men who at night come and remove solar panels from people's homes to go and live well in the trading centers. Those things are all part of their teenage pregnancies. Where That is where they are dealt with. Some of the communities we worked with would report to us that we don't have teenage pregnancies in our village because we are watching everything. Wow. Prof, you, you, you were talking about it and you, I think you mentioned it in the passing that in our traditional cultures, mm. uh, you know, we had 
the Afrocentric view on how we used to do it. And I mean, you talk about the Mituba, you know, communities would say someone who doesn't have a pit latrine should be punished. Mm. It were those things that grounded us as a community mm. that people would, the chairman would call whose baby hasn't been vaccinated or immunized. Yeah. And it was more of a community, not so much looking out, oh, the government has not sent money, oh, it is... Gwanga Muje, for lack of a better word, um, you know, yeah. the community took it up. Yeah. Your neighbor would report you that, look, you have not done A, B, C, D, E, yeah. and therefore you have to do it. The community took was at the center of our health systems. Yeah. But that has changed. Yeah, that has changed. There is a, a, some type of transition which is taking place. Uh, communities are getting weaker and weaker. Because the young people who have grown up have missed that upbringing of being grounded into their own communities. Partly, you know, they say children, UPE, everyone must go to school. And then there is what is called children's rights. If you, you discipline a child, they can take you to the police, you, the parents, and the police will listen to the child. So in the communities where we work, this is one of the issues which has been identified. The, the education system takes these young people to school and they then drop out of primary school, even secondary school. The quality of education is poor. Their attachment to society, their communities is weak. And they can't even live as peasants in the rural areas because they haven't learned how to grow crops and so on. But they also want a good life. And they are now gathering in so many trading centers. If you drive along the roads, you see these people. They are playing cards, games, what? But at night, they become thieves. So this is a major threat to social cohesion in our country. And this is what we found through this community engagement work which we have been doing. You, you've, you've really been uh, putting your soul out for community engagement and primary health care. And in your, in, your, in your conversations, you seem to suggest that it's the founding principle of a resilient health system and therefore needs to be yeah. grounded so strongly by the state, yeah. right? Correct. That is what it is. If, and it is with the resources that we have as African countries, it is the quickest way, virtually the only way that we can achieve that uh, statement of saying, leave no one behind. Because like here in Uganda, the community health systems here have got those village uh, health workers they call them VHTs, village health teams, they work because they work in teams. They have registers, village health registers, which they should use to visit homesteads. They would come to Mr. Serwanja's house. Does he have blood pressure? What is his blood pressure? Is he diabetic? And they record those things down and they do something about it as well. His wife is pregnant. How is she going to deliver? So, that we can do that with very little money. And if we are able to do that, then leaving no one behind will then have been achieved. So I am a, pass a passionate advocate for primary health care. And we have just launched in Uganda here a national community health strategy. Uh, during the week, this week, which has just ended, there was a retreat in Kalangal where they took a lot of people to talk about this. I would like to see that community health strategy become the turning point for Uganda. You've heard the President M7 talk about uh, Ministry of Diseases, we should focus on prevention and, you know, this is the way to do it. Can we do it? It may also just pass as another document. <laughs> <laughs> just like many just like many and that will be such a shame great such a shame it would it would really be such a shame it would be such a shame i i i feel you i hear you loud and clear when you mm. say that we need to strengthen our community approach to health mm. because 
then if we own it and you mentioned it very well we need to be reminded that our health is our responsibility but let's just take it a notch higher um and i we saw that that was very 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 important during the covid-19 pandemic let's get to our health centers and health facilities mm-hmm. i know for example that government tried to construct health center tools to get these medical services closer to the people mm. literally at parish level yeah. where people would go i know that the world bank sank a lot of money in constructing health center tools and as well as st- medical staff quarters mm. where people can could come professor masa you'll be surprised what's happening there if you go into the ground and i'm sure you sometimes go to the field these health center tools are not as active as you would expect them to mm. be the medical facilities i mean i visited one in i think it was in kitgum deep in there and what i saw was really just a bit heartbreaking um these health center tools i mean i just saw cows and goats oh, uh, at the mm. outpatient ward yeah. i saw i mean they have running water they have everything i saw the staff quarters they have baths no one seems to be there and i don't I, i don't know i don't know what was happening because i then asked what happened to the district supervising mm-hmm. that people actually these health center tools are actually working professor yeah. and that someone who got malaria or fever or something had to go to the main referral hospital um to get treatment yeah. health center 3 to uh, the health center 3 also was not in very good shape um well health, health center 4 um i i visited again i i centered my investigation and research around kidgum and lamor it was just fascinating what i found prof how i mean you you started right at the community level let's now take it a notch higher to the health center 2 and health center 3 uh, management and operations what has been your catch right. and yeah having moved around this country well uh, 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 what you, there are two issues here WHO have got what they call building blocks of health systems. There are six of them, but two of them to me are critical, and one of them is leadership and governance. That is where that issue comes from. Leadership of the health services in the country is decentralized to the districts. And the district leaders should have the capacity and the will to make sure that those lower level health units are actually supervised and i think that is what does not happen in this case and then also the communities allow that to happen <laughs> we talked a little bit before yes the communities should be the ones who would say hey why are bats here why are goats in the wards where are the owners of those services so this community health committees which i talked to you about that is one of the things which uh, they have achieved they have improved the relationship between the communities and those health center twos and threes in the sense that they support those health workers and that takes us to other another building block financing a lot of times the health those health centers have no drugs mm. in them so the drugs are delivered for maybe three months and they are all finished within the first few weeks and why should anyone go there why should the staff be reporting on duty so we also need to address health services financing mm-hmm. and uh, here in Uganda uh, in fact per capita health uh, financing has declined in the days when i was uh, director general we were spending around 63 dollars per person now it's less than 50 dollars per person partly because of population growth Uh, and a stagnant budget and competing priorities so we need as a country to relook at our health financing 
we've talked about introducing insurance and again and again for so many years. <laughs> <laughs> it has not the National Health Insurance. Yes, correct. Oh, God. Yeah, so my... Long coming, my, 20 years plus. Yes, my suggestion for that is that we should uh, agree here in Uganda what we call a minimum health package, which should be accessible to every citizen as near to their homes as possible. We have that package already, but it can be revised. And that package should be funded through the tax base. <coughs> but then we should also have a national health insurance scheme, which everyone contributes to, but then it is used for funding those services which are beyond the basic package which need more sophisticated interventions. And the sooner we do this, the better. All the countries in the region here have got some form of national health insurance, except Uganda, I hear. Uh, and and that's my problem, Prof. Mm. You have been at the Ministry of Health. You're yeah. now yeah. an expert. You are, you've published different papers. You, have, you oversee the health sector in Uganda and in Africa at, as a whole. For you to build a very strong health and resilient system that can be able to support you or your country through the next pandemic, is you must look at the cost of treatment, yeah, which is the out of pocket in this country, is mm. absolutely yeah. annoying. I mean, if you if, if you got if you got sick, I mean, many of the people who are in the working class have insurance. Uh, maybe they are covered by these private insurance companies. Mm. But if you are not, you will go into a health facility, even sometimes public health facilities, and they will say, "Go and check." Your blood, you have to pay. You go for the CT scan, you have to pay. You go everywhere. You end up spending a lot of money. And conversations around the National Health Insurance Scheme have been on for over 20 years now. What is the problem? Is it lack of leadership, which goes back to what you said is a fundamental in, 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 in strengthening our health systems? You talked about leadership and governance. What is the problem? with this government not really taking the issue of national health insurance seriously? Well, uh, 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 I think it's a question of now political commitment because that uh, a message of good health at low cost, pillar number one is political commitment taking health as a social good, a universal social good for everybody as a political issue. And here, I think the, the bill has gone to State House and come back. Bounced. Uh, bounced. Last time I checked, they were yeah. still doing consultations. Yeah. And it's supposed to be written for and, cabinet. And, and, and yes, and I think it seems to me the president is not sure that once you start collecting money from people, it will be properly used. Back to leadership and governance. But if we have a strong community health system where communities are participating, they are meeting regularly, they are being encouraged to demand for services when they are needed, it will help to reduce corruption. So I think that is the main fear about that uh, uh, national community insurance system. Will it work? But I think we should try. Let's try. Let's see what uh, weaknesses we experience, what uh, struggles, and we solve them one by one until we get it perfect. The sooner we start and start learning, the better. Every country is struggling with health financing, all the countries in the world. But we have to be bold, we have to take risks, and we have to be clear about, uh, 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 unintentional about what we want to do. So my appeal, is let's start the health insurance scheme and learn as we move forward. Professor, I can't agree more with you because honestly, you saw what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. The fees hit the roof. Mm. I know that there are families that had to give land titles yeah. um, to get treatment, yeah. access to the intensive care units, the, you know, the high dependency units. Yeah. It was literally people who had money 
were the ones who perhaps who made yeah. it through it became Correct. very difficult Correct. and so to shock absorb that or to shock absorb us from going through the same thing in case something like that happened we need to actually actualize yeah. the national health um, insurance scheme absolutely we need to do that and the sdg3 when it is stated in full uh, or universal health coverage is about everyone accessing quality health care without facing financial embarrassment so those two go and let's become part of the movement to get this done how do we do this i think also uh, our advocacy system in uganda maybe we are all to blame somehow we need to find a way of storming parliament we need to find a way of sending ordinary people to state house to say give us this we have cso uh, you know it's like uh, moses yeah. mulumba's cso yeah. so so afena haki the center for health the, human rights and development and yes, all others they, they, they are all others well, we need to get together and actually go and demand for a national health insurance scheme and uh, let's try it let's see how it goes if yeah. there are errors we correct them as we move forward but not doing so ends up with many people not accessing healthcare yeah you know driving to come here everywhere you look there is a pharmacy there is a medical clinic that is there very, is a very lab true. there is what well, that is all because the public health system is not available and we have just allowed it to happen like that and, and we've seen countries where this has been a success yes. i mean in rwanda in kenya i mean if you've been to the uk you know how the nhs works yeah. uh, it's mm. just yeah fascinating how it works yeah, i mean correct. you just present your nhs number yeah. and then you yeah. get treatment yes you know state N- of the art correct N- nhs it was a political decision after the war it was a political decision they didn't have money they were still recovering from the consequences of the war but they said the health of the people is important let's give it to them and uh, and it carried them through the pandemic it, yes it was tested to the limits but it sustained them yeah it helped them go through that yeah and it was a very fundamental pillar during the pandemic correct and that is the other thing which we need to be prepared we had covid but they are going to be more covid like things happening sooner or later there will be another pandemic and we need to be prepared we need to have a health system which is ready for that with the ebola of the year 2000 here in uganda which was in gulu area there we learned a lot again about the need to engage communities and then to have a national command center So Uganda actually is one of the countries who have a structure inside the country for monitoring and responding to pandemics. We uh, 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 need however to make sure that those uh, uh, infrastructure are funded fully so that when the pandemic breaks we have that community health system which reaches every household and is able to get the messages out and to get the services to the people and um, uh, the 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 in Uganda we have those structures you yeah. know you have the LC1 system LC1 LC2 LC3 LC4 all those are ways of reaching people governing yeah. people yeah and health should become a big agenda of all those levels interesting what you're saying um i wanted us to perhaps take a deeper dive into the health workforce mm. which is also very very central um in strengthening our resilience yeah the medical workers on the front line the people who give it all i mean i remember i covered the covid-19 pandemic on the front line i i saw how medical workers risked it all I was in one of those wards at the beginning of the COP, of the pandemic and that journalist that the ministry was saying got covid when it was you know the first days and I remember how these guys would come into the room you know 
they would work hours like hours every hour some of them contracted the pandemic some of them died i know that there's a report that was released by the uganda medical association of medical workers who died on the front line yeah. but the medical workforce in this country has you know has been demonstrating year in year out that the government doesn't really um, take them seriously and it's very core that we do yeah health workforce is a big issue very very big global issue very big global issue i spent about three and a half years at who headquarters uh, as executive director of what is called global health workforce alliance it was a global partnership bringing down all stakeholders and the issues are that there is a global shortage it is called global health workforce crisis widespread shortages maldistribution poor working conditions and the root causes of it are one that the developed countries are short of health workers they need more and they just don't have enough young people to go into their army to go in the health services to go into the banks what and so on so they are taking from us And then, so we have a lot of brain drain. There is plenty of brain drain going on now. Uganda, it's out of control globally. And, and you know, I was having a conversation with um, the executive director, at, the director general, I think, at, at the U- Uganda Virus Research Institute, Professor Ponchano Kalebo. Mm. And he was saying the same thing. He's like, look, I have trained people in virology, pe- deep you know, people have PhD and they're studying viruses and they have started doing vaccines, but they have taken they have gone and while i don't want them to go they are leaving <laughs> he told me i have lost some of my top top brains that is what is happening right now because those uh, northern countries are short of health workers their populations are aging they need also medical care in old people's homes so now they have even modified this they say health and care workers not just health workers. <laughs> uh, so that is happening. But also uh, the other thing is management of health workers. Here in Uganda, we have a big problem in that the Ministry of Health, what the leadership who are responsible for uh, human resources, these are people who for two years they are in the Ministry of Health. Then they take them to Ministry of Agriculture. They take them to uh, after two years to another ministry. Their main interest is to say, is Omaswa's file up to date? Has he taken his annual leave? When is he due for salary increase? But that is not what we want. What we want is capacity to link the disease burden to the skills of the health workers. Mm-hmm. Those should be the people who are leading the health workforce. Say that again, Prof. It's very important. We need to have capacity to link the disease burden of the country to the health workforce skill. And this is not something anyone can come and do. It is a highly skilled. If there are uh, uh, a thousand deliveries in this district per month how many midwives do we need how many neonatologists do we need how many anesthetists do we need and to be able to calculate that they are formula and so on we don't have capacity to do that here in this country and in many uh, african countries so uh, 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 it is one of the campaigns which i uh, am waging to make sure that there is a curriculum which is developed if it is by WHO headquarters or even we here in Uganda we could develop it and our schools Makerere and so on should start to develop courses which teach uh, people how to plan for health workers and to manage them so that they are distributed properly even their recruitment into medical schools you know it is been found globally that people 
tend to go back to work where they came from. So you find that people who enter medical school in Makerere are just people within 15 kilometers of the, the, the city center. And when they graduate, they are the ones who will get into aeroplanes and go abroad and not go into Anaka and so on. So we need also to have a system where we recruit into training schools in such a way that when they graduate, they will be able to go back and work there. And a lot more than that, we also need to ensure the quality of training. There are a number of uh, private um, schools which are cropping up here. Medical schools. Yeah. Medical schools with questionable, questionable quality. And, you know, it's a big issue. It's a big issue. Government has done well to increase the salaries of health workers. But then they are not managed, like I've just said. There are no people who know how to manage them. And they are just there floating around. And then they are also frustrated because even when they have skills, there are no drugs, there is no this, there is no that. Poor working conditions. And when someone comes from abroad and says, I want to take you, they just run. And it is happening in Uganda every week. Some health workers are getting into aeroplanes to go. Some of them are actually frustrated. I mean, every year, there's no year that has passed without medical workers striking. Either intern doctors or the full doctors who are doing under their association, they're going to have a medical association every single year. And it's not, it's not unique to Uganda. It happens in Kenya. Correct. It happens in Malawi. Correct. It happens in Zimbabwe. Correct. So what has happened in Africa is that the training in numbers has gone up, but employment has not gone up, which may even have gone down. So you now get uh, people leaving training institutions and not getting employed. You, I was very shocked to hear that the government of Uganda was saying they can't pay in tons. How on earth is that? From the very beginning in tons, it is just part of the professional growth path of every health worker. And if you don't uh, pass through it, you don't get registered and so on. And there is work for them. They have got uh, 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 job uh, uh, responsibilities, which someone has to undertake and they are paid for. So I was very surprised to hear that debate that they were not able to employ in terms. Very surprised. Yeah, they did. And it, it was terrible because then every time those medical workers lay their tools down, we lose a number of people. We, we, people die, yeah, people die. So this uh, health workforce, you are right to point it out. It is one of the six building blocks of WHO. And to me, after leadership and governance, it's the next most important one. Because if those two work well, leadership and governance and health workforce, they should then be able to address the question of financing through competent uh, 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 dialogues. What we are also missing, what we recommend in managing health workers is to have in the country a structure, what is called CCF, Country Coordination and Facilitation. We need a committee which brings together the health sector, education sector, finance, public service, and also professional associations to be able to develop a national health workforce plan together and to fund it. There is some committee between health and education, but then it doesn't have all the others. You know, when you were saying that, I remember I hosted um, the president of the Anesthesiologists Association of Uganda. Mm. He was just talking about how many anesthesiologists that we have and the population. Mm. And there are very few compared yeah, to yeah, the many. That means very. someone is not planning because then they would have looked and said, from your view, look, we have so many surgeries happening every year. So can we have many more to actually incorporate? Yeah. And so there's a strategic decision to train more and Correct. entice people more into the anesthesia department. I think that's what you're trying to emphasize. Correct. 
We need a strong health workforce department there, which is um, uh, 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 occupied by people who know how to link disease burden and skills. And then they say we need so many anesthetists in Uganda in the next 10 years. How This is how we are going to train them. We need so many surgeons. We need so many obstetricians and so on. And so it goes back to the training school. Then the training schools are then uh, 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 given quotas of how many they should train. And to meet when, the demand. Meet the demand. And when they come out of training, they should go straight to jobs. So that's the plan which we should have in the country. Interesting. Doc, uh, Professor, we're running uh, out of time, but let me just engage you on the aspect of financing of Africa's health sector. You realize that a lot of the money that goes into the health sector that supports the health sector is from donors. I mean, the Ministry of Health in Uganda is a classic example. About 80% of the money that goes into the health sector is donor funding. And the dollars can change any time. Priorities of the West can change or for the donor community can change. Right now, we're talking about the Israeli-Palestinian war. We're talking about the Russia-Ukraine war. And in, in a snap, um, you know, money can change. We know that it's time for Africa to actually start taking seriously um, its health sector and fund it so that in case of any shock, we are not um, shaken as well. We need to pay attention to funding yeah. our health sector locally. You know, And while I'm speaking about this, Prof, I'm reminded about what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic as well. When What we saw, for example, in the West, uh, the, the, the rest to the vaccine, I remember that you know many of the countries at the time channeled their money to produce the vaccine, you know, the big pharma, uh, people, Pfizer, the uh, AstraZeneca, the Johnson & Johnson, everyone went and they, because they'd invested earlier, it was easy for them to get vaccines in six months, record time. Uh, you're a medical doctor, you're an expert in the science, you know that it takes about five to ten years. But they leveraged on that, you know, investment into uh, the vaccine manufacturing and all that to actually be able to produce these vaccines. And then they donated to us. So we sort of were in the waiting list. We were saying, oh, we started campaigns of vaccine equity. Do not be mean, you know. But they invested, uh, they invested money uh, in their health sector themselves. What message do you have for the yeah. continent, uh, Africa, on how it is urgent for us to take domestic financing to the health sector as a matter of national sovereignty? Well, uh, African people value their health. They put a lot of uh, 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 a priority to health. Then our political leaders, wherever there are elections, whenever there are elections, health is always on the manifesto and also on the demand of uh, the voters. But then when it comes to implementation, the political will is weak. Why should donors be the major funders of the health system when we are there ourselves? Do we care? Does anybody care? How can we get ourselves to care, to feel pain, to feel shame when our people are dying, when uh, 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 we are putting money into buying arms and into other areas of investment which do not address the key, key, key and core purpose of the government. The core purpose of the government should be to make sure that people live in peace and they are well. They are healthy and well. Their well-being is addressed. In fact, all those SDGs eventually end up in health and well-being of the people, all of them. So HIV AIDS, as an example, it is we are the ones who have the big brunt of this disease. Why have we not invested in HIV research as much as we should? Why not? So I think, again, uh, politi politicians need to be nudged and we should be looking for ways of uh, uh, 
uh, engaging them so that together with the wide margin of communities, you journalists have a big role to play to create a climate of opinion which will make it mandatory for African leaders to invest in health. Someone said that there is nothing important which happens until the climate of opinion is right. So what we are doing now is to try and create that, uh, that climate, this uh, 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 conversation we are having, yeah. so that more people will demand better and bigger investments in their health from political leaders. Political commitment is extremely important. Without it, nothing else happens. I hear you. Does anybody care? Do we care about ourselves, about our people? Do we feel pain? For example, I started by telling you that the gap between African health indices and other regions is huge. Why is it that when we are here? Why? What are we doing about it? What we see is that when and the people in places of power were supposed to be really taking the issue of financing very, very serious. When they get sick, they are flown. Exactly. They go. Exactly. But they forget that there's going to be times like COVID where you cannot move. Where you can't go. And you're stuck. Yeah. You're in there. Yeah. And it's your health system to save you. Yeah. So that is the, the other big problem. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, when some people are sick, they just get on the plane and go away. So they have no incentives for build, investing. Actually, someone someone was on my show um, and he said, until when the president of this country and his cabinet move into public health care systems mm. and get treatment there, they go to Mulago, they go to um, Iganga, referral hospital, they are admitted at Moroto, regional hospital then is when our health like our hospitals are going to be taken seriously yeah but you know you get a small fever you get a small you know you're sick you, you're flown out immediately and we are paying for that actually oh yeah and and they don't take and you you've asked that question when should we care like why should we care yes you know we were colonized we fought and got independence what are we doing with that independence? It should be about improving the quality of life of our people. And in talking about improving quality of life of people, their health is at the center of it. So if the health of the people of Africa does not become a priority of African people, then we are in big trouble. We are headed nowhere, nowhere at all. You know, those people made their vaccines, as you said. Even their government invested yes. in the private sector. Yes, they invested in the private sector. I mean, they gave them guarantees. Yeah. So, and then we start to say, uh, uh, bring us also vaccines. You vaccine being, equity. Yes. Vaccine equity. <laughs> You remember the vaccine equity campaign? Yes, it is. A, we felt entitled to those people's <laughs> vaccines when they invested and we didn't invest. Of course, there are Africans, there are other global inequities, big ones like our commodities being sold at uh, cheap prices and uh, all that. But that solution starts with us. Do we care? Are we committed to making sure that the independent Africa is as good as the rest of the world? We are blessed with such an excellent climate compared to those other people, natural resources, but do we care? Are we prepared to organize ourselves so that our countries are destination places for our people and not places to run away from, as is the case today? Great question. Prof, as we wrap it up, are we ready for the next pandemic? Well, as, as I said, you, Uganda's infrastructure is there. It is really just switching it on. And I think it, if it finds us and we don't have... Uh, we need to have a reserve fund somewhere because that is what will happen. We know what to do, but we can't afford to do it because of budgetary issues. So there should be uh, a, pa a pandemic uh, fund somewhere, which is uh, maybe wherever it is stored, so that when the pandemic comes, 
we just switch everything on. We have the infrastructure in Uganda. We have. And we have capable people also who are, are, are able to respond. And I told you about our governance structure there, LC123. All those are tools for reaching people. And com compare us with some other countries who don't have that the challenges there. So in Uganda, we are ready in terms of infrastructure and know-how, but not uh, operational enough because of budgetary uncertainties in terms of actually responding. Wow. Yeah. Professor Maswa, your conclusion, where do we go from here? Well, from here, let's work to create a climate of opinion in the country. I love that. In which the health of the people is the number one priority of the people themselves being responsible for their own health. Health is made at home and then the government. And let's get strong uh, uh, leadership in the sector and politically, which is able to make the requisite uh, health plans and leadership capacities all the way down to the to 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 to, uh, to the villages which which everyone the infrastructure is there all everything is there but we are not doing it let's get that health insurance scheme running and let's learn as we move forward there will be issues but that's that's life let's not be too too, too scared by it all right and get the best people to be in the leadership position. That's very important. The most qualified people. And they are there. But then sometimes who knows who is, well, how people get jobs. And that is a major source of frustration. Because sometimes, you know, you have just nothing happens because the leaders are not there. It's a leadership question. It's isn't a, it? because a leadership question. Yeah. Because I mean, it's everything. It is everything. It is everything. Do the leaders care? That's a question for all of us to ponder. Professor yes. Francis Omaswa, thank you very much for sparing your time to speak to us. Professor Omaswa is the executive director and founding member of the Africa Center for Global Health and Social Transformation. He's also a cardiovascular surgeon. He's also the Chancellor at Soroti University. He's worked at the WHO and at different positions um, in Africa. He is also the former Director General at the Ministry of Health. Professor Maswa, thank you very much. And thank you, Solomon. Uh, all the best with this effort. Uh, I'm praying that we are able to get a movement going that will make it possible for all the people of Uganda to access quality health care. You called it a climate of opinions. To create that climate of opinion. That is our job. Thank you. I'm Solomon Serwanja and this is the Haki Podcast. <laughs>